Hi, I'm Cheryl Wills from Spectrum News, New York One, and we're so glad you're here. Welcome to the 92 Wide Talks event, Apple TV Plus's Lincoln's Dilemma, streaming now. We're so thrilled to have Dr. Jelani Cobb and Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson in conversation with us. By the way, this event is also a part of 92Y's Newmark Civic Life Series. That's a new initiative that advances pro-democracy conversations at this critical moment in the U.S. and around the world. We're so pleased to have with us today Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson and Dr. Jelani Cobb. Kelly, why don't you start by introducing yourself and telling us about your involvement with this docu-series. Sure, so I, I started on with this um, series I, about a year or so ago. Now it feels, everything feels like a blur, but um, it's always a pleasure to be able to talk about my expertise and what I know about the abolitionist movement and the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln. And I'm really excited to be a part of a project that really shows nuance and the complexities that were involved in the Civil War and the tough decisions that Lincoln had to make and how he got to those decisions. Um, so what I love about this documentary is that it really does that. It's not necessarily rewriting history, but it's showing us different perspectives, different lenses of looking at this moment and sparking new conversations about what's been left out of this narrative and what's been left out of this story. Yeah, and as we learned, a lot has been left out of this story. Lincoln is in some ways the quintessential politician. He is trying to walk this line of how much do I give to each faction and how do I please each faction? And in that sense, you know, he, he has to be extremely diplomatic. He was trying to navigate the currents of really irreconcilable ideas. And if you add into that equation, the fact that he's a politician who may or may not believe 100% of what he's saying in public at any given time, what you have is the makings of an enigma. Jelani, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about your involvement with Lincoln's Dilemma? Sure. Uh, you know, my name is Jelani Cobb. I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker. Um, I'm also a historian, and my involvement with this project uh, has been, I guess, uh, about a year as, as well, maybe a little bit more. And, you know, I was able to come on as a producer, as a co-producer on this. Uh, and I was excited from the outset, you know, just talking about the torturous, complicated, uh, and, you know, very weighty uh, route that Lincoln took to emancipation. Uh, and, and the way that his own evolution mirrored, uh, it was kind of metaphorical uh, in terms of the nation's grappling with race. Uh, and so I was just uh, sold from, from day one and I was excited about being able to work on it. We can't know or understand Lincoln at the same time that we have an emotional investment in preserving him as a savior. But it is in understanding the trial and error and the failures and the shortcomings and the contradictions that he becomes most useful to us. And really only by understanding the things he got wrong can we really grasp the magnitude and importance of the things that he got right. Lincoln was elegant and he was passionate, but what he wasn't was a, an emancipator right from the start. So yeah. as a historian, you know that to be true. His legacy has been sliced and diced and muddled, but he, he he's often depicted sometimes, especially in lithographs from the 19th century with black people bowing like, thank you, you loved us so much that you yeah. were the one to free us. But that is not accurate. And that was brought out in this docu-series. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Lincoln would have abhorred the title, the, the Great Emancipator. He pushed back on that idea. And scholars and historians have been pushing back on this idea for decades, saying, no, Lincoln did not free the slaves. The slaves in, um, freed themselves. And I think it's such a point, an important um, point to, to really feature within this documentary, because it shows you that 
Enslaved people had to escape. They had to leave the plantation. They had to get to union lines. They had to defend themselves. Um, and really, you know, it's Frederick Douglass and enslaved people on the ground that are making this a war of abolition. Lincoln doesn't necessarily enter the war wanting to free slaves at all. If, as a matter of fact, he's like, if we can keep slavery in the Union and keep the South in the Union, then so be it. So it's really Black people that are pushing compelling Lincoln to make these decisions, to make it a war of abolition. Um, and there's a great quote in which Lincoln is talking to newly freed um, Black people, and he's basically saying to them, keep in mind, and I'm, I'm botching the quote, but he's saying, you know, I did not free you. God freed you. And then he says something I think that's also incredible. He says, and if those people don't believe that you are free, then you take your sword and you take your bayonet and you show them you are. And it's just so incredible to think about how Lincoln really makes this like 180 turn and not just um, seeing how enslaved people emancipated themselves, but understanding what would be required in order to protect their freedom. And speaking of Africans, Kelly, emancipating themselves, no one can tell the story of Lincoln without telling the story of Frederick Douglass. It was very well told in this docu-series, and Frederick Douglass is another historical figure that has many, many layers. So talk to us about the importance of Frederick Douglass's legacy as it relates to President Lincoln. Yeah, I, I don't think you can understand Lincoln's success without Frederick Douglass. Link, uh, Frederick Douglass is so responsible for many of the changes, the major changes that we saw, particularly during the Civil War. He's he's pushing the Emancipation Proclamation. He's saying you have to let black soldiers fight. Once black soldiers fight, he's like, hey, you have to pay them equally. You have to pay them fairly. So. He's constantly advocating for black people. And he's one of the few black people that gets the president's ear in this way. I mean, you have a former slave himself who manages to also run away, write a best-selling narrative, become our nation's great leader, and then become, in effect, counsel to the president. Um, it's an incredible thing. It is incredible. And Jelani, I want to zero in on those black soldiers, members of the United States Colored Troops, 200,000 strong members of the Navy, black men who, as Kelly so eloquently said, freed themselves. I have to interject a personal thing right here. I am the great, great, great granddaughter of Private Sandy Wills, who in 1863 left a Tennessee plantation and enlisted at Fort Pillow. I think both of you know the legacy of Fort Pillow. Yeah. That's for yeah. another conversation. Yeah. But Jelani, talk to us about the importance of those 200,000 black soldiers literally helping Lincoln bring that country back together and end slavery once and for all. Well, they turned the tide of the war. That's just mm -hmm. a simple fact, you know, that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is paired uh, with the acceptance of Negro soldiers uh, as they would have been called then, in, into the armed forces of the United States. Uh, and so uh, in bringing these men in, uh, and many of these people also, just to talk about the heroism, uh, that they escaped slavery. They managed to find their way to freedom and then risked not only death, but certain re-enslavement. This mm -hmm. was the Confederate policy. Uh, that any Negro taken in uniform would be turned into slavery. And those who had been born in freedom risked being being enslaved for the first time uh, were they captured. And people were willing to take this risk in order to achieve the ultimate demise of the institution of slavery. Uh, and so their heroism uh, is legion and they, they die at numbers disproportionate uh, yeah. to their white counterparts. Uh, and so they see action in some of the worst and most difficult circumstances. Uh, and for much of this time, uh, you know, as Kelly pointed out, uh, were gi given an insufficient wage, an unequal mm -hmm. wage uh, to their white counterparts. Uh, and so that, that, but for, and Abraham Lincoln again, you know, says this, uh, but for the valor uh, of these black soldiers, uh, the Confederacy might actually have prevailed in the course of that war. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can I just I want to add to that Frederick Douglass's sons fight in the Civil War. Right. And right. so two two of his sons fight, Lewis and I believe Charles. Um, That's right. And it's it's so important to understand that, like, Douglas is not just in Lincoln's ear. He literally has his family fighting in the war as well. And so the, the investments just run so deep and, and the stakes are so high. Um, we should, I should also say that, you know, the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Regiment that that fought, if you've seen the film Glory, it came out years ago. Um, but those soldiers forfeited their pay. They boycotted for a year until they got equal rate wages. And these weren't formerly enslaved people that were signing up to fight that had never seen a wage. These were free people that had families to support and they were risking their, their wages in order to demand free pay for themselves. And that's a really important, important aspect of this as well. It is an important aspect. And you know, Kelly, it is also shocking that when I was a kid and I'll date myself, I'm in my mid fifties, no one said a word about the black soldiers who fought in the Civil War. There wasn't any talk mm -hmm. about Frederick Douglass. And there's not much now either. So why is it, and you're a, a legendary veteran educator, why do we still have trouble getting this story as it's told in this outstanding docu-series on Apple TV Plus? Why do we have to depend on Apple TV Plus to tell the story <laughs> when schools are not telling the, the story as it happens? I think, you know, I think it's all hands on deck when it comes to history. I think that parents need to be educating their children. I think that schools need to be doing this work. I think that we need to be reading more books about this history. I think if reading is difficult, there are films like Apple TV that you can watch. I think if you can't watch, you can listen. I'm a big fan of podcasts like and, and Audible. Like there are so many ways. I'm also, you know, I represent the Museum of African American History. There are ways you can tactilely go to these places and and see the actual you know artifacts from that moment the museum of african-american history um the smithsonian in washington dc i think we have a lot of different ways that we have accessibility and we can engage with this particular moment in history um but for some people their the knowledge is not there or they don't know that it's there or for those who do know that it's there you know the willingness to encourage people to go i think is another part of that um, um, but, you know, people like Jelani and I, we've been doing the work for a long time. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I do think that there is a receptiveness, that there is a hunger, a thirst, that people want to get this information. And sometimes the best ways to be able to do that is through film. Film is a powerful tool and it's something you can do within the comfort of your home as well. And in the comfort of schools. And I hope this is shown in schools forevermore because it really does set the record straight. Jelani, Lincoln, President Lincoln faced numerous dilemmas, mm -hmm. the war and also the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And this jeopardized his life. He lost his life for taking these stands, even though so many people were on both sides of the issue telling him, be careful, be careful but he was on the right side of history and sadly he paid for it with his life. Let's talk about the courage of President Lincoln doing what no president would ever do up until he was forced to do it. You know, I think that, that Lincoln is so fascinating on multiple levels. Uh, you know, one, uh, because he is now you know, tremendously popular uh, you know, posthumously. And, you know, so much so that, you know, I spent a semester uh, teaching in Moscow on a Fulbright. Wow. And when I was in the subway, the Moscow subway once, uh, I saw an advertisement for a bank. Uh, and the slogan was that they were trustworthy and that they had a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing that their idea of, of giving the connotation of trustworthiness uh, in Moscow was to have a picture of Abraham Lincoln uh, associated with their bank. Uh, but in his time, you know, he was tremendously unpopular. And right. In the election of 1864, uh, people thought that he was going to lose and he could very well have lost that election. He was widely criticized. There were attempts on his life prior to the one that succeeded. 
Uh, and in the midst of this, he pursued a course uh, diligently of what he thought was in the nation's best interest uh, and suffered through the grievous loss of his son uh, in the course of his presidency, uh, had suffered through his, his wife's own emotional distress uh, in the course of his presidency, uh, and still you know, steadfastly was, was betrayed, essentially, uh, in the election of 1864, in which George McClellan, who was one of Lincoln's former generals, <laughs> ran against him for the presidency, uh, and still diligently pursued the course of maintaining the National Union. Uh, I don't think that you really have much of a comparison uh, in terms of the, the towering character that was required in order to execute those things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, Lincoln had contradictions and the places where he, he wavered and uh, went back and the, the questions that he got wrong and things that he didn't figure out. Uh, I always think that it's important to remember that he had to figure out the most vexing, complicated question in American life in public, in real time, in front of millions of people. Uh, mm -hmm. And his errors in that context look a little bit different than they do is just talking about them in the abstract. It's so powerful that you, the way you said that, because every president prior to Lincoln knew slavery was a problem mm -hmm. and not a single one dared to touch it. One president famously said, it's like holding a wolf by the tail. Mm -hmm. you, you know, <laughs> What's going to happen, paraphrasing, if you let it go? And, of course, Lincoln had no choice. Question for you, Jelani, and this for you also, um, Kelly. Do you think if the Confederate, if the uh, Southern states hadn't seceded, would Lincoln have freed, written, had um, written the Emancipation Proclamation and signed it on New Year's Day, 1863. Do you think he would have, or would he have kicked the can down the road as well? What does history tell us in that regard? Well, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, because you know historians always hate <laughs> counterfactual <laughs> questions, and so um, you know you can get 50 historians and none of them are going to answer that question. Yeah, um, I know. But, but you two are courageous. <laughs> what, I, what, I will say, what, I, what I will say, though, is that, uh, you know, Lincoln, uh, you know, said that the House could not remain divided. You know, that he, mm -hmm. he said even prior uh, to his assumption of the presidency uh, that the question of slavery would have to be resolved in one way or another. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, his uh, secretary of state, William Seward, you know, said that slavery was the part of the irrepressible conflict. Mm. Uh, and so even outside of what happened uh, at Fort Sumter in uh, 1861, right. there's reason to believe that this, this conflict, people knew, uh, even back into the 1850s, uh, people knew that the nation was on the course, uh, collision course over the issue of slavery. Uh, and so if, if that hadn't happened in the way that it happened, it's very reasonable to believe that it would have happened in some other way. In mm. some way. I mean, John Brown said it wrong. Like the, like the Yeah, I was, I was just going to say John Brown. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't, there's a lot of, um, I don't know. I mean, obviously we don't know what would happen if the South did not secede. I, I can say this. There were constant efforts and attempts to overthrow the institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. What the black abolitionists were doing, what their white allies were doing, what John Brown did, what Nat Turner did. Um, there were constant efforts to demolish the institution. But I do think that, you know, the enslaved in some ways made a lot of sense when they thought that slavery was created by violence, that it was sustained by violence. And it made sense that it would only be overthrown by violence. And so while we can't necessarily predict how things would have gone down, I don't think the United States was headed toward a peaceful abolition of slavery. I think they had multiple opportunities, decades of, of activism uh, with the abolitionist movement, and they did not move closer toward abolition. They actually expanded slavery further westward. So we might have another hundred years if not for if not for war.
I mean, I think the other thing that's important to remember um, to the earlier point about like no prior president abolishing slavery, uh, that, you know, the politics of slavery were teeming and complicated. And so, uh, you know, there were legislative hedges and compromises, you know, to say that you can't have slavery in this territory, you can't have it in that territory, or that, you know, the Wilmot Proviso was an attempt to keep slavery out of the territories that were gained uh, in the Mexican-American War. And uh, compromise of 1850 that allowed California to come in as a free state, but then strengthened fugitive uh, slave protections on, mm -hmm. on the other side of it. And so the politics of abolishing slavery were off the table by and large, by both parties, we should say, yeah. um, and not all of which were the same parties we have now, but, uh, but parties generally kept the question of abolition off the table, but the mm -hmm. question of expansion of slavery came up all of the time. Mm -hmm. It was one of the major themes of the politics in that era. And so, uh, and then there are other people who say that if slavery can't expand, that it will ultimately die. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people believe that, you know, in a, a very vital sense that, you know, the battle to expand slavery is the battle to allow slavery to continue to exist. Let me touch another raw nerve with you historians. <laughs> there are some of your colleagues who firmly believe that slavery was not the chief cause of the Civil War. I'll start with you, Kelly. What's your <laughs> response to that? Uh, um, I don't think anyone worth their tenure would make that oh, argument. You know they're out there. Would, you know they're out there. Would, would make that argument successfully. Because okay. even, even if you were to say states' rights, okay, That's states' rights to, right. to perpetuate slavery. I mean, and this is the thing. It's not a matter of opinion, you can go to the secession documents and That's read right. them and you can look at what South Carolina says and you can look at what Texas and Louisiana says. They are clear about why they are leaving the union and they state emphatically that the reason is slavery. So, you know, it, what I always say is go back to the primary sources, go back to the actual document, go back to what people were saying in that moment and they will tell you why they left why they sided with the Confederacy, why the Confederacy was even formed. Um, the Confederacy is very clear about its cause and very clear about its agenda and its motivations. Um, they were honest about that. They were honest about slavery. They were always honest about maybe not how they saw slavery as good and, and civilizing. They're not honest about that. But in terms of their motivations for leaving the country, there's no other reason other than the social, political, and economic control of the institution of slavery, control and perpetuation. Jelani, you want to chime in on that? No, I, I think that Kelly is <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, but I, I will say that not you very know many. That argument is out there, Jelani. Not very right. many academic historians would make that would make that argument. You know, among yes. among professional historians, that's a fairly settled matter. Um, yeah. That argument is popular. Uh, but it tends to have a popularity uh, on the internet or in you know, certain cultural circles or uh, you know, people who have this as a personal belief. Uh, yeah. But scholarship has pointed in this direction for a really long time. Uh, the, res the reluctance to accept it mm -hmm. is more emotional uh, than intellectual at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the rise of Confederate statues, especially, you know, I know we're talking about Lincoln's dilemma and it's amazing, but Confederate statues that emerged many years after Lincoln was assassinated, many years after the Civil War. Explain for those who are watching how this happened. Jelani. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so people assume uh, that the monuments that we see, some of which are being taken down now, you know, were uh, erected uh, at the time, at the, the end of slavery, or erected in the lifetimes of the people that they honor. But they actually were not, uh, for the most part. You know, uh, many of these monuments came about uh, in two waves. Uh, one in the 1890s. Uh, in a time period in which uh, Southerners, you know, particularly white Southerners, were, re were, were rejoicing in effectively the reinscription of a slave regime in the South, uh, or something as close to slavery as they had gotten. Uh, the rise of Jim Crow, a sharecropping system, 
uh, lynching, the elimination of Black people from uh, the ballot, uh, from suffrage, uh, and all these things that had reversed the progress that the Black community had made, or that Black communities had made in the South uh, in that time frame. And as a symbol of this, they began to lionize the lost cause, uh, which was you know, the former Confederates, uh, in a way that even the former Confederates did not. Uh, and so there was that wave of it. The, the second wave of it that you see is uh, in the 1950s, which is uh, in response, obviously, to the civil rights movement. Uh, and you begin to see the resonance of the Confederacy raised again and again and again uh, as a means of refuting uh, what they see as federal government's, the federal government's betrayal uh, by supporting civil rights to the extent that they do. Yeah, if I could add to that, I would I would just say that, like, the title of this documentary is, I think, very intentional. Lincoln's dilemma is really America's dilemma. And so and the dilemma is not just about the Civil War or what to do with the black people or what to do with slaves. The real dilemma is how do we get white people to relinquish white supremacy, to relinquish their allegiance uh, uh, to, to whiteness, you know? And even how does Lincoln, you know, reckon with his own ideas about white supremacy and black humanity? These are the questions that I think we keep coming back to because the statues and the Confederate flag, they are all symbolic manifestations of this dilemma, this dilemma of white supremacy and race and racism in America, this peculiar um, institution and ideology. And so I think what's what's so great about this documentary is that it's it's getting its audience, its viewers to question um, not just the, the hypocrisy in it all, but how much do we really believe in black humanity? How much do we really believe in white supremacy? How much do we really believe in American democracy and freedom for all? Um, this is a dilemma that we're constantly facing as a country. That's absolutely right. And Kalani, when you sat down with your team at Apple TV Plus to put this together, what was important to you to differentiate this characterization of Lincoln when there are so many other films, Academy Award winning films and documentaries and so many plays and so forth about Lincoln? What did you want to see to differentiate Lincoln's dilemma from the others? Yeah, I mean, I think the team at Coonhart Films is really great about this you know, and, you know, recognizing that we needed a narrative of Lincoln that wasn't simply the great man theory of history. Uh, you know, there is a, a depiction of Lincoln, uh, as you know, Kelly talked about before, as the kind of benign father who, uh, de who delivers emancipation upon the benighted Negro masses. Uh, and on the other side of it, there's a version uh, that completely rejects that, that thinks of Lincoln as simply someone who was dragged along by the tide of the times uh, and stumbled upon emancipation at a moment when he had effectively no other choice. And what we wanted to do, and what I think that you know the team at Coon Coonhart Films did really well, was put together a nuanced portrait of both Lincoln and the times, the ways in which he shapes the moment he exists in, and the ways in which the moment shapes him. Uh, and mm -hmm. when we see him arrive at the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, and ultimately the 13th Amendment, uh, it is because he has come to certain realizations, but also hundreds of thousands of people, really millions of people have created a moment in which Lincoln had to mm -hmm. grapple with the questions that were before him. And so it's a mm -hmm. symbiotic kind of dynamic that we were really hoping to pull out. Uh, and there are voices of uh, enslaved people that you hear uh, through narratives. There are voices of uh, mm -hmm. black soldiers that you hear. Uh, there are voices that you don't traditionally hear in lots of these other conversations about Lincoln uh, and the Civil War. And uh, I think that we have uh, created, we set out to create a fuller portrait of this moment. And I think that's what we, we did. And that's exactly what you did. And that's why I applauded it as I watched it. Those nuances I did I have never seen in a Lincoln documentary. So job 
well done. <laughs> Kelly, mm -hmm. you know, he talked about the Emancipation <clears throat> Proclamation. Uh, many people may not know, there were two versions, one in 1862. <laughs> See, I know this stuff, okay, because my family was leaning on this heavy, okay? 1862, and then the one he actually signed off on on New Year's Day, 1863. Tell us about those two, because most people just, of course, know about 1863. I am going to admit, I don't know the differences between the two. Delani, do you know the difference? Yes, the yes. There's a big difference, which is... What is the big first, difference? I'm forgetting. But you, do, but you do know that first. You do know the difference, uh, Dr. Uh, Carter Jackson, because <laughs> that first version is the one that in, that contained uh, the idea that he was going to deport uh, the Black Oh, population. yeah. Okay, yes. I do know right. this. <laughs> yeah, and so... Yes. It is about deportation exactly. and colonization. It is also about compensated um, emancipation. But let me clarify, compensating slaveholders for, for their property, which is, um, you know, if you want to think about reparations <laughs> and the idea that they're proposed to slaveholders is, is kind of um, ironic, to say the least. But yes, absolutely. These were uh, proposals that were first um discussed and it's Douglas that's like, whoa, whoa, we're not sending black people back to Africa. Black people are American. They have been born in this country. This is what they know. This country is theirs. Um, and so, you know, that those ideas get get dropped. But yeah, I, I do know <laughs> what those what the first one is about. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh Jelani, when you look at the Emancipation Proclamation it is a powerful document. It did a lot. Lincoln put a lot of thought into this. Mm -hmm. This wasn't rushed. He knew it was going to change America forever. The language tells you that. And something many other people may not know is he signed many copies to raise money for the war effort. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I mean, first, in terms of the deliberate nature of it, you know, what uh, Lincoln did was, uh, it, it was as a political document, it is brilliant. You know, the Emancipation Proclamation has much less weight as a moral document. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the 13th Amendment uh, is what we're thinking about there. But uh, as a political document and as a strategic document, it's brilliant. You know, he leaves open the possibility. He says that people are emancipated in the uh, places that are in rebellion, leaving open the possibility that if they return to the union, they will uh, not have to give up their slaves. Now, of course, by this point, everyone knows that slavery has to end, um, but he leaves it out there in this way. It also incentivizes the uh, enslaved black people who get word of this to flee, <laughs> to leave the farms and plantations where they were, crippling the Southern economy, which was dependent upon cotton. The Confederate currency was pegged to the value of cotton. And as cotton became scarce uh, and the prices skyrocketed, the Confederate currency, uh, the value of it uh, went through the, the, the floor. Uh, yeah. And so this is really tactically brilliant. Now, as a moral critique, uh, Frederick Douglass had the best line about it. He said that Lincoln had ended slavery where he had no power. Uh, mm -hmm. and allowed it to persist in places where he did. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is absolutely true. Yeah. And so he goes through these twists and turns, always thinking about uh, what the ultimate effect of something will be. Uh, and the, the Emancipation Proclamation opens the door to the 13th Amendment. Now, in terms of the Emancipation Proclamation being used to, to raise money for the, the war effort and so on, uh, you know, Lincoln was, we think of him in a lot of ways. We don't think of him in just as, uh, as, as a really skillful politician, uh, mm -hmm. which he absolutely was. You know, that's just one thing that he did. Other instances, he toyed with the idea in the 1864 election, toyed with the idea of allowing soldiers uh, from states that he was worried he might lose, uh, allowing those sto soldiers to strategically go on leave around election time so that they would be at home to vote. Uh, you know, there are all these things that, you know, he's constantly kind of weighing and, and you realize that, you know, uh, he had humble beginnings and uh, he gathered his education as he could, uh, but this was no ignorant farm boy. No. 
He was no ignorant farm boy from Kentucky. I was just a great <laughs> way. Uh, Kelly, you know, we can't have a conversation about Lincoln and the many dilemmas that he faced without talking about the eloquence of the Gettysburg mm. Address. Mm. So many people know that that is one of the most famous and it goes by really quick, of course, yeah. but he wasn't the keynote speaker for that uh, dedication of that cemetery. Talk to us about Lincoln's crafting and the mm. eloquence of the Gettysburg Address. Lincoln, I mean, they're, they're so, they're, so few presidents in American history in which you can go back to their speeches again and again, and they are just so transformative. And the Gettysburg Address is one of those speeches. I would also say his second inaugural address is also really powerful yes. as well. I mean, I, I, that's the one I reference in my classes right. all the time. But it really, again, I had mentioned this earlier about setting, you know, sort of like blueprints and frameworks for understanding this crisis that America is in and these hard decisions that have to be made. Um, Lincoln, if, it, if anyone has time after they've watched the documentary, I highly, highly encourage them to go back and to read his, um, you know, Gettysburg Address and his speeches and to really sit with it and think about what exactly he was up against. Because I think they, like I said, they are transformative speeches, powerful, gripping, sobering speeches. I, I and eternal. Say, Stand the test oh, yeah. of time, Jelani. Yes. I, I have to say that if, uh, if I had only one speech, one presidential speech uh, that I could give a group of students for them to understand the kind of moral important weight of the presidency, it would be that second inaugural address. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is just also stunningly beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and like the Gettysburg Address, uh, very it, it's also stunning for its brevity. Uh, yeah. People were yeah. there in the 19th century where giving speeches was a form of entertainment and you settled in, uh, expected the person to talk for an hour or so. And you know, Lincoln stands up, says what he has to say, and then sits back down. Uh, and in the, in the course of those few moments changes the mm -hmm. nature of American yeah. democracy. And, you know, I want to wrap up this conversation. Both of you are such brilliant minds, and it, it, it's just an honor to listen to you uh, talk about Lincoln's legacy. I want to end with how this nation changed forever mm -hmm. after he was assassinated in 1865. So much after Lincoln was murdered, this country changed in so many ways, and it's never been the same since. Why don't I start with you, Kelly? Let's talk about what's changed since his assassination. I would say that uh, while we still have a long way to go, I don't want to paint a picture of roses and unicorns and lollipops. I will say this. He opened a door that could never again be closed. And once that door of liberation, emancipation was open, once you get the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, once Black people have real opportunities to have a place and a space in this country that they can make their own, it is a complete game changer. Um, no other country in the Atlantic world has something like Reconstruction, has something where enslaved people go from being enslaved to elected officials within a generation. You don't have that. And so um, Lincoln does a lot of things that I think uh, are just unprecedented. But his work is not finished. His work is not done. The work of enslaved people and their descendants is not done. And I think it's a it's a powerful story that we can come back to again and again because the work is ongoing. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, Lincoln's death is the tragic final note in an, a sprawling American tragedy. Mm. And, you know, in the aftermath of it, you know, there are uh, Lincoln critics, you know, who uh, I encounter sometimes in, in the course of my work. And I remember telling someone, having a conversation where they said, uh, Lincoln was reluctant and he dragged his feet and, you know, he was ultimately conservative. And I said, however conservative he was, he was still radical enough to be shot in the head in Ford's theater that night. Mm. That he had 
pushed the nation to a place uh, from which his en enemies knew and his antagonists knew it, it could not come back, that it could not go back to the old order. Uh, and his death, I think, just cements how high the stakes were. Uh, and the ultimate thing that I think Lincoln's death points out, you know, that he is murdered by someone who is enraged at the thought of Black people being equal citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that is what, you know, part of what drives John Wilkes Booth. Uh, and he is this testament to the dangers of white supremacy for white people mm. in this country. Uh, and so I think that, you know, he stands for a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I really enjoyed this conversation and uh, I want to personally thank you, Dr. Jelani Cobb and Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson for sharing your thoughts on the 16th president of the United States, we can never talk about him too much because he changed this country. And I think that uh, this docu series is brilliant and it's on Apple TV Plus and we encourage everyone to check it out. It is streaming now. And as for this 92 Y Talks event, thank you all for tuning in. We really appreciate you until we meet again.